Hello and welcome back to another day of a chemistry video lesson. Today we're going to go over notes number 39, properties of acids and bases. So we have an essential question and the question is, what are the key characteristics of acids and bases? And so we're going to take a trip back down memory lane and kind of review kind of what you should have remembered in middle school. We all remember middle school, right? Right. So acids and bases, looking at them from the naked eye, we see most likely two clear liquids. The question is, how can you tell them apart? Well, in order to think back in time, back in the olden days, there were no analytical tools. Instead, we recognize them based on chemical properties. So this is where eighth grade kind of hits back home. Acids, we should all know acids, they have a very distinct sour taste. For example, citric acid is pretty sour in taste. They also react with some metals to produce hydrogen gas. On the other hand, they also react with carbonates to produce carbon dioxide gas. And now we have to talk about bases. We talk about acids. Bases, on the other hand, instead of having a sour taste, we say that they're bitter. They feel slippery when mixed with water. And they essentially do the exact opposite of what an acid does. They cause acids to lose their acidic properties when they are mixed together with these bases. Now, let's take a look at an example. So this is a picture of a statue of George Washington, freshly made, and then this is the same statue after this phenomenon, and that phenomenon is acid rain. What happened? A chemical reaction occurred. So let's take a look into the chemistry of how this happened. So when we're describing acids and bases, we have to come up with a chemical model. How do we describe the chemical reaction that's happening? And the first proposed model is called the Arrhenius model. The Arrhenius model of acids and bases kind of tried their best to describe how acids and bases work and react with each other. In general, the Arrhenius acid definition is defined as acids being able to have the ability to release their hydrogen ions, H+, in a solution. And on the other hand, they would describe as Arrhenius bases releasing their hydroxide ions in solution. And so we take a look at these examples here for acids and here for bases. We can see that this is an acid, hydrochloric acid, and it did exactly do that. It released its hydrogen ion in a solution. Cool. But what about an Arrhenius base? This is sodium hydroxide. In solution, that, hydro that hydroxide ion popped off. Cool, it fit the definition. But here's a problem. It's not exactly universal. There are some exceptions to these definitions. A good example would be this molecule here, ammonia. The thing is, I take a look at ammonia and I don't really see any hydroxides. Why did I mention hydroxides? Because, well, taking a quick look at what this text paragraph is saying. Hydro I mean, ammonia acts as a base, not as an acid. And it doesn't have hydroxide. So how can we create a better definition, a more broader definition of acids and bases? In comes in this next model in 1923. It's called the Bronsted-Lowry acid-base model. And so the wider range to kind of expand the definition of acids and bases is now defined as this. Acids would be more generally described as proton donors. I'm giving away a proton, a hydrogen ion. They're the same thing. Hydrogen ion, proton, they are the exact same thing. And then, but, and then bases, on the other hand, they accept the protons. So acids donate, bases accept. And here's an example. This is a general equation of an acid, and this is going to be the base. And so when we add this acid and this base together, we create a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. What happened? Well, by definition, what did we do? If we said that this is an acid, it should donate a proton. Taking a look, this is HA. And then after, we just have A. Well, where did the H go? It went here, into the base. 
And this is a very unique molecule, something that we want to emphasize to you guys. It is called hydroxide. I mean, whoa, I messed up there. It's called hydronium. So hydronium, H3O plus, hydronium. That's what we're going to make when this base, water, accepts a proton. And so with that said, let's take a look into the other definitions in blue here. Conjugate acids and conjugate bases. What is the significance of them? Conjugate acids are the substances that result from a base accepting a proton. So before the reaction, it was a base. And then after it accepted the proton, it's now called a conjugate acid. And let's flip the tables the other way. What is a conjugate base? Well, this was the substance that resulted from losing the proton. To kind of tie that in, well, before we had an acid, before the reaction. And then after this acid donated its proton, it now became a conjugate base. So with that said, I hope that clears things up a little bit with this example here. But just in case we want a better visual, here's another example for example two. This is going to be a base, and this is your acid. Remembering what we mentioned earlier in the last slide, what do acids do according to the Bronson-Lowry definition? Bronson-Lowry acids donate their protons. So we expect this H2O to lose its proton. And so let's just take a look from the acid and after when it turns into a conjugate base. Notice that this is H2O and this is just OH, fitting the definition of Bronson-Lowry acids. It donated its proton. And then quickly on the other hand, we have ammonia and it's going to accept the proton. So base is going to accept the proton and then after it became an acid because it accepted that proton. And now with that said, let's continue to practice. Now, when it comes to these practice problems, we want you guys to just take a look at these at your own leisure and be sure to ask us if any hiccups happen along the way during your practice. But essentially, this is what we do expect you guys to know. We do expect you guys to know which chemical is going to act as a Bronsted-Lowry acid, the donor, and which one's going to act as the Bronsted-Lowry base, which is the acceptor of protons. And so if we can get you to predict what is going to be made after as the products, you should be in good hands for this portion of the lesson. And now, let's just talk about a very special molecule, water. If you haven't noticed, water did both jobs. It can do the job of an acid. It can also do the job of a base. We would describe that as an amphoteric substance. Amphoteric. Amphoteric substance. It can donate or it can accept protons depending on the situation. It pretty much depends on what the water is going to react with. For example, if water, our amphoteric substance, is going to react with an acid such as hydrochloric acid, it's going to actually accept the proton from hydrochloric acid. So this is going to act as our acceptor, our base. So this is our base, hydrogen, I mean, water, and it's going to take in that proton from hydrochloric acid to turn into, what is it again? Oh yeah, hydronium, H3O+. And so with that said, here's another example, but reacting with a base this time. So this is water, and this is reacting with ammonia. Last time we checked, ammonia is a base. So if ammonia is a base, water should act as a acid. And so this water is going to donate its proton next. And so if water donated its proton, that means that that proton is now going to enter into ammonia, turning that into ammonium. And now we have hydroxide, OH minus. Now, with that said, it's time for us to talk about how strong or weak an acid is. And so what do we mean by strong or weak? Does a chemical compound go to the gym daily to lift weights to get stronger? Not necessarily. It's more on how strongly these, um, what is it, these acids or bases react in solution. So 
Here's kind of a visual, an example to kind of illustrate what I mean. When we're talking about a reaction, we consider two types of these reaction terms, forward and backward. So with that in mind, keep those two words in the back, in the back of your mind as we go through what we mean by backward and forward reactions. So in weak acids, we favor the backward reactions. In other words, a weak acid is defined as weak because that chemical compound does not completely dissociate into ions. It's a very poor conductor of electricity when put in an aqueous solution. Just like those Ed puzzles that you've seen earlier in our previous unit for aqueous solutions, we've seen examples of weak acids being put into a electrode. It did give off some light. It did conduct some electricity, but not too much. And so if we favor the backward reactions and we say that this is what makes an acid weak, then on the other hand, if it has a weak acid property, then it must have a strong basic property. And then likewise with the other way around. If we are dealing with a strong acid, it would dissociate very strongly. It would completely dissociate or almost completely dissociate in an aqueous solution. So if we are favoring the four reaction, we have a strong acid. But if we have a strong acid, we should probably end up with a weak conjugate base. That's kind of the way it works. If it's strong here, it should be weak over here. And so on the other hand, strong acids are very good conductors. If put into electrode and we have a light bulb, that light would shine very brightly compared to a weak acid. And so with that said, here is your visual. So when it comes to um, all of this, we go over this in detail in one of our previous videos with, um, with our previous unit on aqueous solutions. You can take a look at how each kind of molecule dissociates into water to its relative strength based on how brightly that light bulb shines. So we're gonna move on to this. Now, I said weak, I said strong, and there's a couple of ways to kind of easily kind of go about understanding which one's weak and strong through this table here. The way that we kind of want to uh, give this to you guys and also the way that I kind of re remember this in college is this. I memorize this table of six strong acids. And I go, okay, if I know these six, they are strong acids. Everything else, when in doubt, if it's not those six, it's probably weak. And so when it comes to this table, if I can memorize these six, I say it's a strong acid. If it's not on this table, it's a weak acid in general. And so with that said, let's take a look at the different types of acids that we have. This is time for you guys to take a look back into your Greek and Latin classes and we break them up into their prefixes. So the first one we have is a monoprotic acid. Mono meaning one, protic, proton. One proton. Hydrochloric acid has one proton. Hydrofluoric acid has one proton. And we get it, right? One proton. Diprotic, di means two. Protic, proton, two protons. Sulfuric acid, H2, SO4, two protons there. When it dissociates, and we understand the rest, right? Triprotic, we get the message. Tri means three, just like tricycle. Tri, three, protic, protons, three protons. And now, with that said, there is a small type, a, there is a subtype of acid that's not straightforward, carboxylic acids. These are still acids, but what makes them stand out? It's this group right over here. It is the COOH group, otherwise known as your carboxylic group. And it combines with other molecules to create some type of carboxylic acid. And so if you see COOH, it's probably an acid, specifically a carboxylic acid. And now, with that as I said, how do you prepare for the quiz? Well, take a look at all these bullet points, and if you're confident in describing these acids and bases, how they react with each other, what makes it strong, what makes it weak, you're in good hands. 
And so if you guys liked and saw what you see in the video, smash that like button below, click on that bell for the notifications, and we'll see you guys next time.